afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, to talk about uh, pulmonary artery pressures and pulmonary hemodynamics in the critically ill. Um, this is a really, really useful topic. Uh, I'm finding that we have to, you know, impress the significance of this a lot. Um, and we're going to go through this short lecture, and then I'm going to try and show you two cases of how I used it yesterday when I was reporting echoes. You know, this is something we look at on a very, very day-to-day -day basis. And I'll explain, you know, a systematic approach of how we go through it. And it's not rocket science. And I hope this is useful. OK, so assessing pulmonary artery pressures in the critically ill uh, echo has got to be our first line for doing this. It's you can get it even with not the best images in the world. And you can at least get an idea, even if you're an extremely difficult to image patient. Um, and uh, we'll go through some of the tips and tricks of how to do that. And essentially what we're trying to look at, particularly I'm talking about hemodynamics for the pulmonary artery pressure estimation, particularly systolic pulmonary artery pressure. I'll also mention diastolic and mean. But also more importantly, I guess it's the hemodynamics in terms of particularly vascular resistance and vascular, uh, maybe not so much compliance. I think it's probably in the, in the research realm at the moment. But the idea is if there's significant blockage downstream. And of course, into this, you have to have an understanding of right ventricle size and right ventricle function. Um, so let's start with the, the, the first one, the most obvious one that I'm sure everyone knows about, which is talking about how to estimate systolic pulmonary artery pressures. So systolic pulmonary artery pressures are estimated on echo, and they're not bad at doing this on the basis of studies that compare pulmonary artery catheter to echo is that we look at our peak velocity of our tricuspid regurgitation jet. We do 4v squared of that. So we do the Bernoulli equation, the modified Bernoulli equation, 4v squared, and we add on right atrial pressure. I'll talk a little bit more about right atrial pressure in a second, but if you can't get the right atrial pressure, we can just add on five or seven, depending on the literature you're reading. And sometimes that's actually not that bad in the critically ill. So uh, studies done by people like Michelle Slama um, and uh, his colleague, oh, I've forgotten his name, Picardo, Mercado, sorry, I've forgotten his name. But they did a study in, uh, you know, around about, I think it was something like close to 100 patients, maybe 70 patients looking at um, echo versus pulmonary artery catheter. And they found that if you just added on seven to your systolic well, up to your Vmax of your tricuspid regos, that wasn't too bad at trying to figure out what the systolic pulmonary artery pressures were. So this is obviously going to be dependent on making sure that you've got a decent angle and making sure your Doppler angle is lined up with where your tricuspid regurgitation jet is. And so the way the process you do that is in whatever view you've got, whether that's your parasternal long axis view tilted down to your RV inflow view, or whether it's your short axis view where you're looking over at the tricuspid valve and sort of have to maybe tilt a little bit over towards the patient's right side, or whether you're in your apical four chamber view, you've got to put the color box on first, figure out where the direction of that jet is and try and optimize as much as you can. Sometimes even the subcostal views, the one to look for to try and have an idea of uh, getting that best angle. So again, utilizing all available views that you've got. Maximize the Doppler angle. And then you want to optimize your trace. So you've got your baseline at the top of your screen. You make sure you've got about three cardiac cycles on the screen. Set the gain right. So you're ignoring the fuzz. You're just looking at that uh, uh, the modal velocity that comes through there. And then try and place that's where your cursor lines up. And ideally, maybe looking at uh, you can average them if they're unusual or just in this in this one, I think it's uh, Sorry, you average them if you've got different views that you're trying to find the optimal one. In this one, I think it's, unre it's not unreasonable just to grab the Vmax that you have there and take that as your, as your value. In assessing the severity of the tricuspid regurgitation, and again, maybe this is a time for another talk, but um, uh, Faraz Pathan recommended me this paper, which I thought was going to be great. And we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into our cases in a moment. But um, this is done by the amazing Rebecca Hahn, who understands the interventional a uh, cardiologist um, over in the States who's, who's meant, to be, uh, meant to be wonderful. And she's done this great state-of-the-art paper in Jack from a couple of years ago. I put it in our Dropbox folder, um, but this is meant to be a wonderful one talking about the severity of tricuspid regurg. And I'm going to refer back to this. And again, steal, steal her some of our, the ideas that Faraz has told me about that he's gleaned from some of these papers um, when we're talking about our severity of tricuspid regurg um, in some of the cases. 
Okay, I don't use a lot of these other ones, I'll be honest, in my in my day to day practice, uh, but these are there and they're good for the exam in terms of trying to get that icing on the cake. So we got diastolic pulmonary artery pressures where you use we use the end diastolic pressure, which we can see here of the tricus of the uh, pulmonary regurgitation place. So we're using the, uh, if you like, the end diastolic pressure. We do 4V squared on that. So uh, pulmonary regurg end pressure gradient. And then we can add on our right atrial pressure. Okay, and that's meant to be a, a again, a I think the evidence behind this in the critical ill is, is not really there at the moment, to be honest, not that I've seen anyway, to say that this might be a not unreasonable way of trying to figure out what the diastolic pulmonary artery pressures are. Again, I'll say I don't use this a lot. I mainly use systolic pulmonary artery pressure and looking at pulmonary uh, resistance, which I'll show in a sec. Mean pulmonary artery pressure, you can get from your uh, uh, either tracing out the tricuspid regurgitation jet. Again, that is dependent on a decent trace. So you've got to make sure your Doppler angle is right, that you're tracing it correctly. And that means your gain has to be correct. And you trace it out accurately, ignoring the fuzz. Okay. And that can give you your mean RV to RA gradient. Alternatively, you can do it again with your pulmonary regurgitation trace, but you're grabbing the early diastolic pressure. And then you can add on the right atrial pressure to that. Um, They've looked into this to try and see which is the most accurate. It's not been done in the critically ill that I'm aware of. And uh, you can, uh, and it can be more accurate if you try and do things like bubble studies to try and, uh, you know, inject the agitated saline to try and get an idea of uh, the, get that whole trace. Sometimes it's not perfect. Uh, again, this is not something that I routinely do, but might be useful to mention in an exam. Okay, now this is useful and this is something that I use all the time. So the RVOT, looking at the profile that comes through there can give an enormous amount of information that I think is often quite easy to obtain and can be quite useful. So the, the, the first thing is, is again, getting the right view and getting the right Doppler angle. So there are two ways you can get your, or maybe let's say three, there are three ways you can get a RVOT trace. So this is where you put your pulse wave Doppler in the right ventricle outflow tract just before the pulmonary valve. In Benita Anderson's book, she talks about putting it a centimeter behind the pulmonary valve in the right ventricle outflow tract. Um, in other guidelines, I've seen them suggest that you try and look to get your closing click, as you can see here. Uh, I, I don't feel strongly either way or the other. Um, because we're not trying to, we, we care about that very much in the left ventricle because often we're using that to estimate stroke volume. I do not do that a lot with the RVOT. Hence, I don't really care if it's right next door to the pulmonary valve or a little bit behind. What I do care about though is getting the right Doppler angle and getting the right trace. So again, as the same with all Doppler, it's angle dependent, get your, what you're interested in, filling the screen, three cardiac cycles in one trace and try to reduce the, um, what do you call it? The, the artifact in here, you try and reduce that, um, that change there. I'm sorry, momentarily, I've forgotten what that's called. The artifact that we get in there or artifact or the... Um, Ghost artifact, is it? No, to, to, to say it again, it's, it's not the near field artifact. Um, it's the stuff which trying to get the low numbers that are sitting in here. Uh, I'll remember in just a second but trying to reduce um, that so you can accurately see whether where it enters into the baseline. And then you can start, make, start to make measurements because the reason why I'm getting so finickety about that is because the first thing that we can have a look at is the pulmonary acceleration time. So that's the time it takes for the, from the beginning of ejecting blood from that right ventricle outflow tract to the end you look at the timing difference between here, it says from one to one up here. So the timing difference from where it starts ejecting blood out of the right ventricle outflow tract. So here in this sort of tilted up parasternal long axis view, the blood is obviously going away from you, hence it is below the baseline. And you look at the timing difference between there to there. And if it's less than 90 milliseconds, that is a sign of significantly raised pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay. 
I do not use any of this stuff down here. I put it in. I don't know really why I should probably take it out because I don't think it's useful in the critically ill. When you get tachycardic or when there are lots of things going on, I, I you know, I think when you're timesing anything by 0.75 and minusing it from 79 or 0.62 here and minusing it from 90 to try and estimate what your mean pulmonary artery pressures are, I think in the critically ill, that's, that's probably not going to be that accurate. But what is, I Think suggestive, and I'll show you the paper in just a second, is that if it's less than 90 milliseconds, that uh, gradient there, that is, a sign of, that is a sign of significantly raised pulmonary vascular resistance. Okay. The other thing that's really great is this little notching here. So we call this mid-systolic notching. Normal looks like this. It's got that parabolic pattern. Even here, it's probably on the more subtle side, but you can see it here as well. There's a little notching that sits in there. And that is indicative of significantly raised pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so those are two two sort of things that I do use quite a lot, particularly this mid-systolic notching. You can't fake that, right? You can certainly mess up this pulmonary acceleration time. It's easy to make, you know, just a small difference can change it from being 80 to 120. So obviously you've got to have accurate imaging and accurate Doppler angles. So that's easy to mess up. But the mid-systolic notching sure as hell isn't. And I'll show you quite a nice example of that in a second. The last thing that I also think is I do not use enough and I should use it more is the RVOTVTI. So that's actually tracing out this pattern here. And here you can see the VTI of about 14 meters, I think from 12 to 16 or so uh, centimeters per second or 0.12 to 0.16 meters per second is, is, is normal. OK, and I think particularly if you're doing things like I've seen recent evidence about changing peeps or if you're looking for, you know, the right ventricle um, increased uh, afterload, you know, looking at a change in an RVOT would be useful. And I don't do that enough. And I, I'll look to try and have a better example because I'm trying to get better at this. But I think it's a, it might be a really good way of trying to find that optimal peep. Um, and it's not just about RV function, of course, when you're trying to find that. And it can be other things. OK, so just in summary, so from the RVOT, the useful things are the pump acceleration time, less than 90 is bad. The mid-systolic notching, which is really hard to fake, which is really useful and sign of significantly raised pulmonary uh, hypertension. And the RVOT and less than 12 or a decreasing level can be a sign of increasing uh, RV afterload. OK, this is probably the best paper I've seen talking about why I care about the pulmonary acceleration time. So this is a group that uh, they've got to be from Scandinavia, don't they? And they looked at pulmonary hypertension cohorts and looked at particularly pulmonary vascular resistance. So they're measuring it versus Woods units. Uh, so an invasive measure using Woods units versus echo. And they looked at all measures of tricuspid regurge. They looked at strain. They looked at S prime and they looked at ratios between the two. And what particularly they found was the best one at trying to differentiate significant pulmonary vascular resistance. So that's Woods units up here, you can see, was the pulmonary acceleration time. And that magic number of 90 milliseconds predicts greater than three Woods units of the pulmonary vascular resistance on the reference standard of, of uh, right heart caths. And so this was kind of the best evidence that I think we had. It, it, it's a little bit old, but I think it's the one that's referenced in all the articles. So, you know, well done study using the reference standard of an invasive measure and the echo shows that pulmonary acceleration time is probably the best one of doing it. Nothing done in the critically ill and I think that's something we should try and look into. Okay, potential pitfalls are, are plenty. Okay, so here's an example of a, a peak tricuspid regurgitation VMAX. And here, two traces done on the same patient, one where the gain is optimized. And so that means you turn down the gain, looking for the, the darkest part of it. That's what's known as the modal velocity, as opposed to the vein being, the vein, the grain, the gain being particularly high. And you can see the difference where you've got Vmaxes of 4.73 they've got up here as a, as a maximum, versus down here when they've turned down the gain where it's closer to actually 3.6. I'm a bit of an exaggeration, but you kind of get the idea that if you are, if you set the gain too high, you're going to pick up a lot of noise, all right? And that's going to give inaccurate gain settings. Um, the way I've had this always pictured in my head is if you look at a pink fluffy cat there, 
you know, beautiful fluffy cat that's got the sun behind it. You can see that it looks about four times the size of what it should look like. You know, the skin of this beautiful little kitten is 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 in there. And if I asked you to tell me the size of the cat, you wouldn't go on the size of where the fur starts. You'd go actually where you can feel its body. Uh, and that's what I call ignoring the fuzz. Um, Faraz Pathan, my cardiology friend with his wonderful beard, he, he always describes it as the chin and the beard phenomena. Uh, I, I call it ignoring the fuzz, call it whatever you like, but um, make sure that you just ignore the fuzz. Yeah. You've got to make sure your Doppler angle is perfect. Uh, don't use findings in isolation. We'll talk more about this in the cases. You know, don't use things just by themselves. You've got to take the clinical picture into account, take all the echo values. Each one's got good things and bad things, and that's what it's about trying to weigh it all up. Measure it at the same time, uh, because as you know, the, the, you can get respiratory variation, particularly on the right side of the heart. Uh, they recommend doing it, measuring an end expiration with spontaneously breathing. I, I do do the same in the critical ill, I got to say. I try and measure it in the same cycle, and it's always an end expiration. Probably when someone's on mechanical ventilation, I should probably flip it round. But my argument behind that is that as long as you're doing it at the same time, in the patient, then you can compare values um, and ensure you try and get the maximum Doppler trace you can. And again, that's all about getting good Doppler angles. Okay, accurate right atrial pressure, bit of a bugbear of mine. Um, IVC, as you probably heard me say a couple of times, I, I think is brought with difficulty and is generally quite badly done in the critically ill. Um, if you're going to do it, try and do it at the same time every time. Know that there are lots of confounders if you're trying to estimate right atrial pressures, because if you've got horrible trigastric regurgitation or you've got patients on pulmonary pressures, trying to estimate someone's volume status based on right atrial pressure, I think we know is not very accurate. But we use it for the right atrial pressure, obviously, to, to measure our pulmonary pressures. And that's where we do need to know sort of what the right atrial pressure is. To estimate that, you can use your IVC, but you also use your hepatic vein. So hepatic veins are about trying to get one of those hepatic veins pointing towards where you're scanning, so the Doppler angle is accurate. Uh, putting your pulse wave Doppler about one or two centimeters behind the junction with the IVC. I make the gate a little bit bigger because it can sort of swing in and out during respiration. And here's an absolutely perfect one. So of course I put a perfect one in the, in the talk, but it's often not that easy, I'll be honest. Um, and, to, and you can look at them both together. And the idea is, is if you've got systolic greater than diastolic, that's suggestive of about five millimeters. If you see no systolic forward flow, it's up around 20. And you match that with your, uh, with your IVC findings, okay? So if you have normal, uh, you know, a collapsing IVC, so less than 21 millimeters with more than 50% collapsibility, that might suggest you know, five to seven millimeters of mercury. You can then have a look at the hepatic vein. And if you've got systolic flows here, you can see systole from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. Systole is greater than diastole and a bit of A wave reversal. That's normal. Five millimeters of mercury sounds good. And the other side, if you've got it greater than 21 millimeters, doesn't collapse, stays plethoric during the respiratory cycle. You've got here, we've got systolic flow reversal. So here during systole, Again, it's going backwards. There's diastole going forwards. That's suggesting very raised right atrial pressure. You might be able to call that 20. We don't really have a way of estimating higher values than that. So again, sometimes when it's right atrial pressure is that raised, it can certainly be higher, um, but we don't have a way of doing it. So this is the kind of way that I do it. This is based off uh, Garvin Kane, uh, who's um, you know one of the worldwide gurus on pulmonary hypertension at the Mayo Clinic. This is what he suggests doing. Um, and that's what I try and do. Okay, uh, let's check everyone's still awake. Um, Louise, so which of the following should be used to determine the severity of pulmonary hypertension? Peak systolic pulmonary artery pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure, RV size, RV function, all of the above. All of the above. It's always all of the above. That's a terrible question. Absolutely correct. Uh, if ever it says all of the above, it's absolutely always that. Um, and that's uh, absolutely right. Um, you've got to take everything together. If we're talking about pressure, to get pressure going, you've got to have something making the pressure. If that something making the pressure is not very strong, you will not create as much pressure. So you can't estimate the severity of pulmonary 
hypertension based on one thing alone, all right? So you've got to be integrated with an idea of what the right ventricle is doing with that pressure. How is that right ventricle responding to an increased afterload? The right ventricle responds to a chronically elevated or an acutely elevated afterload by dilating and sometimes pushing that septum over into the left ventricle to try and compensate, to keep that flow going. And that's the most wonderful compensatory mechanism. And it's a wonderful compensatory mechanism until it isn't. And then you get right heart failure and congestion, and that's what's known as core pulmonale. And that is a very, very bad thing to have when you're critically ill. Okay. So summary of this slide is just use everything in combination. This slide, I think, Troy demonstrates that quite nicely, that you see your pulmonary artery pressures. They keep going up and up and up as symptoms of worsening pulmonary hypertension occur. So this is about pulmonary arterial hypertension and progression through from normal and then compensating through to getting into real trouble with it through to being in a life-threatening scenario. And you'll see the pulmonary artery pressures will change and they will change as the cardiac output drops, which is as your right ventricle deteriorates and starts impairing the left ventricle filling, okay? You can see here by these two uh, red dots here that your pulmonary artery pressure is actually the same at both of those values, but there are two very, very different clinical entities. And hence, you need to take into consideration your right ventricle function. If you consider things like pulmonary vascular resistance in there, though, that has more of a linear function. And so it is worth including that. And that's where the pulmonary acceleration time and looking at that mid-systolic notching and looking at your LV cardiac output and looking at your right ventricle size and function all, all comes in. Okay, so right ventricle afterload. There are some ways of trying to assess that with resistance, thinking of pulmonary acceleration time. This would be the more classic one that they use when they're doing invasive cats, where they look at the difference between your stroke volume and your pulmonary artery pulse pressure, for example. So you can do it with echo in, um, oh, sorry, looking at your mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge pressure divided by the flow. And the way that we can do that is with your tricuspid regurg pressure gradient divided by your RVOT. Uh, it's good for research or using your pulmonary acceleration time is another way of doing it, okay? The, the compliance and the capacitance, which is what I was talking about before with the stroke volume and the pulmonary artery pulse pressure, excuse me for getting those around the wrong way. Um, the pulmonary artery compliance and capacitance is meant to be an even better prognostic marker for pulmonary hypertension based on the, the literature than pulmonary vascular resistance, but no one's ever really looked at this in the critically ill. And again, might be a really nice thing for us to have a look at in terms of trying to understand how to do things like set PEEP um, and how to try and estimate RV afterload. The idea being that resistance is only part of the process and it's uh, almost a static component. If you're looking at the pulsatility or the dynamic nature to how our uh, cardiovascular hemodynamics work, particularly the right ventricle, we need to consider how that pressure and flow interact and how they transfer power to the vascular bed. And that is where capacitance and compliance come in. Um, and uh, this is described quite elegantly, I think, by Pinsky in some of his papers. Again, I can put a reference to that in the Dropbox folder. He did a really nice article in this in, I want to say, Critical Care a few years back. Um, and yeah, talked about the RV function and in in how it relates to uh, the pulmonary hemodynamics. Um, and he describes this quite elegantly. This is just an example of how they've done it in the, uh, in the critically ill, uh, sorry, in the pulmonary hypertension uh, cohorts. And again, showing those with the highest capacitance do better than those with the lowest uh, capacitance. Um, and it was an idea of, it was the, the best marker there in terms of risk ratios, in terms of survival. Uh, you can, as you can see up here, the stroke volume versus the pulse pressure had the best hazards ratio, uh, similar with cardiac index. Um, Emma, are you still there? Do you want to answer a, a question? So uh, I think I'll probably get this one pretty good. So which of the following is least likely to predict outcome for patients with pulmonary hypertension? Is it RV size? Systolic pulmonary artery pressure, RV function, pericardial effusion, or pulmonary resistance. I don't know if you're still with us. Do you want to have a go otherwise? No. Um, Hi, Sam. Oh, hello. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, at least, like, least like, likely to predict outcome. 
Um, I, it's a little bit tricky. I know that pericardial effusions are associated with worse prognosis for these patients um, in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Um, I kind of want to say systolic pulmonary artery pressure. And, you, um, right. and why would you say that? Because of the, the graph that you just showed on the previous one. <laughs> With I love I love that um that you know that putting all that together it's really nice. So yeah, it's yeah. a really nice graph which I've stolen mercilessly off of Garvin Kane's tutorials. Um, it's it's really a great. I had the same thought as well. It, it's really set it in my head when you see things like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pulmonary vascular resistance. We'll just go through these again. RV size. We know as someone gets worse and worse, the RV size gets bigger. That's a bad sign. Uh, RV function as it deteriorates. That's one of the reasons why pressures not the best marker, and pericardial effusions, as you said, it's a marker of poor RV billing, if you like, it's getting raised uh, congestion in the venous system, and that's why that's bad, and pulmonary vascular resistance, you saw from that curve, has more of a linear approach, so very nicely done. So how does all of this relate to the critically ill? Do we care? Uh, we, we very much do, of course. We, we know that core pulmonale is associated with much worse outcomes in patients who have lung injuries, such as uh, this is one of my favorite papers from Antoine Villabaron showing much higher rates of mortality in those with, um, with core pulmonale in, in ARDS. Uh, I think other, other areas where we would see acute pulmonary hypertension, uh, as well as patients with ARDS, is of course PE. Uh, it's patients who have septic cardiomyopathies. It's patients who are fluid overloaded it's patients who have RV dysfunction from all of the above. Um, what we don't know exactly is the best marker in the critical ill. I think there's a lot to look into in that. If we could figure out ways of estimating diastolic dysfunction in the, in the RV, we might be able to pick up things a bit earlier. And there's an incredibly nice or elegant way that um, Susanna Price, who's one of the cardiologists and intensivists over at the Brompton in England, who describes things like a pre-systolic A wave which is the idea that if you have uh, a bit of forward flow going in the RVOT and in the main pulmonary artery during uh, atrial contraction. Uh, so just before you see systole, you see a little bit of spurt of blood coming through into the main pulmonary trunk. She describes that as called a pre-systolic A wave. And that's a sign of a very poorly filling right ventricle or a, a right ventricle that has uh, no ability to, to stretch anymore. And that could be a sign of horrific RV diastolic dysfunction or restrictive RV filling, as she describes it. Things like that might be a really good marker to try and figure out when that, you know, there's a, there's a phase where the RV can compensate, but when you get over that, everything goes to hell and it's very hard to pull a patient back from that, from that brink. Things like that are some of the markers that I think we need to try and figure out with echoes so that we can try and pull our patients back from the brink. Um, so we might just do a couple of cases now, if you're up for that. Um, and it's all about the pulmonary hemodynamics. As I say, these were done from yesterday. So these are something that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. I think they're really useful. And let's see if I can um, see if we can show some of these. Um, Jamal, you're going to be doing the exam fairly soon. Can you, if I bring up this case... Are you able to help me with this one? Sure, sure. <clears throat> okay, so this is a patient who's uh, into the ED. Um, it was, just comes from yesterday. A gentleman, uh, and then the question was, uh, query right ventricle strain. This gentleman has been diagnosed with a pulmonary embolus. It's, uh, and that was, a, it was a good load on, it's not a saddle embolus or anything, but a good thrombus load on the CT. And so hence, we've got an echo coming through to, I guess, try and figure out if he's in that submassive category. Um, he's certainly short of breath. He's not horrifically desaturating. Uh, he hasn't had syncope or anything. And so this will be a standard echo that we get. Let's just go through the box down things. Okay, take me through this one. All right, so what we see here is a parasternal long axis, uh, transthoracic. Um, I guess the pertinent findings is that he uh, appears to have normal LV systolic function um, uh, from the windows that we have. Uh, I, aortic valve uh, looks normal, thin leaflets, 
at least in this view in the mitral valve coaptation also looks normal. The RV that we can see in this view, uh, I would I would wonder whether the um, RVOT is enlarged or the, this part of the RV is enlarged, but obviously I would want to confirm that in further uh, views. Um, the descending aorta looks reasonable and there's no suggestion of an effusion in this view. I mean, by that I mean pericardial effusion. Okay, um, this, uh, so look at this image, tell me what you think of this image and then critically analyze it, please. Um, so I'm just trying to get my screen in a position where that's appropriate. So this, uh, so this is a Doppler ultrasound um, on kind of like a focused view of the PA. Um, it, looks, it looks like continuous wave. Um, because all the velocities are filled in. So we're looking for the highest so that, velocity. That, that might be coming through badly. This is going to be pulsed wave. We've got a little yeah. bit in there. Sorry, and it's probably just coming through. It's certainly meant to be dark in the middle of it. Okay, okay. It's yeah, pulse I was wave wondering Doppler about that. in the RVOT. Okay, so it's pulse, pulse, if it's pulse wave Doppler in the RVOT, um, then I guess what we've measured here is the angles. Um, I mean, you were talking about the acceleration time. Um, I measured but, uh, it three I'm, times here, 54, 66, and 74. Yeah, so as you say, that's less than 90 on repeated measures. So that would be concerning for, for uh, elevated pressures. Yeah, and again, the pulmonary acceleration time, and I don't, just to be pernickety, forgive me, is again, it's about resistance. So the, the pulmonary acceleration time has been compared against Wood's units. So I think mm -hmm. if it's a sign of increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What about the shape of the profile? Oh, uh, well, that middle, the first one, I guess, it, I'm just going to zoom in and it, whether or not there it has an appearance of notching. Yeah, nice. And that's so, so again, I mean, obviously you have of... three, you have six, but that one could be suggestive of notching and even yeah, the one right. after that. And what does that mean? Well, you're saying that was suggestive of more severe um, Elevations in pulmonary vascular resistance. Yeah, we, and that's and again being pernickety. Forgive me. Is is it's significant? It's not really. It's like moderate to severe, greater than moderate. Greater than moderate. Um, so it, it's it's indicative of severe. Okay. And the last thing is is critically analyze this picture. What do you think about it? Well, I mean, in that regard, if if this is pulse wave, I mean, um, you know, you have more you have more loops within the image than required, um, and whether or not you could uh, increase your scale. Um, there's a lot of, and even move your baseline. There's a lot of dead space, which uh, could be going some way to making your measurements more inaccurate. Fantastic. So we should be really looking, if you can see my mouse moving, we should really be focusing down here. That's all we're interested in. We've mm. got a lot of nice, uh, I'm going to steal it. I like the uh, dead space. There's dead space in there. It's good. Can I just make yeah, that in comments? Sure. Going back to that picture. Where's the group? Oh, that's Jamal. He's Jamal. Uh, uh, when, yes. when you He's in pulse wave, wave, when you actually lose that Sorry. thin outer line, so that it looks more like a continuous wave, it means yes. turbulent flow. Okay, okay. I, and I guess the other question is if if we move the baseline and increase the size and et cetera, et cetera, uh, kind of improve the the appearance of this technical aspects. Do do you think that? it might become clearer that it's pulse wave as opposed to continuous wave if we only had three images when yeah. they were captured. Yeah, I can't change the scale, but I think yeah. it would become clearer if there was better optimization yeah. of that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and the flat, the flat. Section, yeah. Which you can see on that picture. Absolutely, here we go. So what about this one? Uh, well, so I think the most pertinent finding in this short axis view um, is the abnormal motion of the intraventricular septum. So there is, I mean, you would want to time this to see whether it was systolic or diastolic, um, but the abnormal motion of the intraventricular septum suggests that there's either pressure or volume overload of the, of the RV. So I'm just taking it slowly. So here is systole. So I'll just go from the beginning to QRS. Mm -hmm. So during systole, as it's contracting, it does move towards the RV and the end mm. of systole though, it does be, it does become flattened and then so it definitely big. becomes flattened, flattened during diastole. Mm. So that would be suggestive of more uh, pressure, a uh, volume overload. Yeah, so during diastole. systole, it's, systole, it's pressure. pressure overload, mm. diastole, it's um, volume overload. 
and I'd be inclined to think there's an element of both in there. Mm. What do you reckon? Yeah, and I mean, not that we've seen it uh, particularly well, but um, the RV does look enlarged in at least that view, the short axis view. Very nice. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, again, maximizing my view here. Um, it, it's it's hard for me to tell which view this is from the, it comes, oh, so but it looks like an RV short, inflow short outflow. Axis, short axis view across the tricuspid valve. Yeah. Um, and the Doppler angle would probably be okay. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, so I guess the, again, this is a Doppler ultrasound. The most pertinent finding is that we've used the TR, the, uh, the maximal velocity of the TR jet to determine um, uh, the pressure gradient. And it looks like in the top left corner, it's 45. So then you would have to add what your estimation of the CVP is to get an estimation of the RVSP. So yeah, it looks like 45 okay. plus whatever you presume the CVP to be. Call it seven for me because it works better with what I'm going to say. Well, then the the, the RVSP or would five. be 52. Fantastic. Oh, 50. We need so, 50. And can you put that together with the things that we had at the previous day, uh, previous slide? So maybe if I just did that with... Okay, so I guess what we've got here is, you know, a gentleman with known pulmonary emboli who's been sent in for an assessment of his RV function. Um, we have pulmonary uh, acceleration time, which uh, definitely suggests um, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, um, even to the point of it being severe uh, because of the presence of notching. Um, short axis view suggests that there are elements of both vo RV volume and also a degree of pressure overload. And uh, now we have uh, RVSP estimation, which is 50. And even if we then um, converted that to mean pulmonary artery pressures, um, that would be elevated. Nice. But as you say, and, that, and is, that is perhaps the less. What about, what about these two together? Why am I putting these two together? It's got a specific, uh, it's got a specific, specific name associated ooh. with me. So I guess I'm looking at this value. I don't know if you can see it probably. So I'm particularly looking at the pulmonary valve acceleration time that's somewhere maybe a little bit under 60. And mm -hmm. I've got a tricuspid regurge VMAX uh, pressure estimation that is also less than 60. Oh, is this the 60 60 yeah, sign? Nice. Yeah. Excellent. So this is the 60 60 sign. So it's uh, often associated with PE because you've got a person who's got significantly elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. And so significantly raised pulmonary vascular resistance and a likely acute component, which means that the RV cannot generate as, yeah. uh, as high Higher. pressure as, as, as someone who's got chronically elevated. And hence, we don't have super high systolic pulmonary artery pressures because the RV is acutely in trouble. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you, if we've seen that sign, what about... I don't have the greatest, I don't have the greatest uh, uh, apical views, but we did our best, and yeah, this one. What do you think? What, what, what do you reckon we can see here? Well, it's, it's coming through at a very low frequency at my end, oh. but I imagine given everything, it's going to be McConnell's sign. Yeah, good man. Good man. So I guess in a bit of a dodgy view here, we've got severe RV dilation. It's bigger than the left ventricle. Again, we've got an example of the interventricle septum being pushed over to the left. We've got a big right atrium with the interatrial septum pushed to the left with raised right atrial pressure. And then that RV free wall has got McConnell's sign. So that's relative akinesis sorry, excuse me, relative hyperkinesis of the apical segments and the, the basal segment and the mid-segment down here are sort of being tugged up and pulled up. So yeah, hyperactive apical segment, and that's known as McConnell's sign, again, uh, associated with uh, PE. Yeah, nice, buddy, excellent work. And so again, just a nice indication there of how the pulmonary hemodynamics have to be taken into consideration with a compensating RV, which is 
not functioning normally and has dilated up acutely. Cool. Um, all right, Louise, do you want to have a go at the second one? Okay, this is a, this is a great one, this one. So, so if we've looked at acute changes in uh, pressures, now let's have a look at more of the sort of the subacute. So this is a 77 year old patient who was put through the lab yesterday, who's increasingly short of breath. Uh, the concern is for, uh, with a query history of uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they're worried about a pan-systolic murmur in this 79-year-old man or 77-year-old man. And the concern is, is there a cardiac cause for the increasing shortness of breath? Uh, and I should also tell you, he's known to have a pacemaker in situ. So this is a parasternal long axis view. I can't see a pericardial effusion. The right ventricle looks normal in size by comparison and appears to be contracting. The walls, the anteroceptor wall is not thickening well and is actually moving away during systole. The eight the aortic valve is mildly thickened, but appears to be opening well. The infraroceptor wall is also not thickening particularly well, and the movement of the mitral valve is reduced, which may suggest a low cardiac output state. The left atrium is markedly dilated. The, there is a pleural effusion on the left, which looks significantly big. All right, nicely done. Start with that so one. this this is a parasternal short axis view of tricuspid regurgitation. In the color box, the the size of the regurgitant flow looks large, and looking at the tricuspid B max. Yeah. Um, hang on. Sorry, I just can't tell that. Um, 3.27 meters per second, which is suggests that there may well be significant pulmonary hypertension. When we look at now, talk to me about the severity of the tricuspid regurg. So the jet area appears greater than 40%. Mm. It's fairly turbulent mm. and it hits the back wall. So that's could well be consistent with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Nice. What about the profile here that makes you think that it might be severe? So this is, uh, well, we don't have a complete envelope, which suggests that the angle, because it's slightly eccentric, the angle was probably underestimating it. Yeah, nice. It looks like it may be the early peaking shape, but it's hard to tell with a gap. In I think it, all very fair comments. And I was just wondering, looking at this though, it looks very heavily filled in, which suggests there's a lot of blood flowing around. As you say, it's quite chaotic, but also I was wondering whether this kind of it got that early cutoff sign. Um, it does seem to end at the right time, but it, for all those reasons you just said, it's it looks like it could be significant. We've got to be worried about when we're looking at the color. Again, of course, I can make this color look worse if I turn up the gain, and you can make it look like it's bigger. And alternatively, I can also make it look smaller if I turn down the gain. And so we've got to be careful with our. You've got to be careful with your Doppler, obviously, for the for obvious. So, reasons. but if you adjust that so that we just lose the the color scatter in the tissues, then that is the right amount of gain. Absolutely. And make sure that and we've got a half still, decent scale yeah. up here to make yeah. sure we haven't got a scale of like 30 or something. And here we've got a scale up of 80 with all of this makes it absolutely suggestive that we've got significant regurgitation. And you can see the pacing wire. Yeah, good call, good call. 
The other little tip and trick that I got from Faraz, which I might just mention again, I think I mentioned it before, see if I can find a better example. There we go. You see, we've got a PISA that comes through there. I yeah. don't think it doesn't come out brilliantly, but we can see that there's a PISA that doesn't look that small. It looks like a decent sized uh, proximal isovolumetric surface area. And what I mean by that is it, it looks like there's a little bubble sitting on top of the tricuspid regurgitation. I can actually stop that, I think. Can we? So if I go to mid systole, you know, I can see this bubble that's sitting on on top of the tricuspid regurgitation jet. Okay, and um, obviously there are ways that you can measure that and you, if you zoom in and move the color baseline, then you can do a proper estimation of what the jet size and volume is. And I don't do that a lot in the critically ill, but the, the, just the tip and trick that I heard from Faraz is that we know that the tricuspid valve has more of a tented appearance. It looks more like a pyramid than the mitral valve. And so you've got an angle at the top of it. It's at least about 120 degrees. So when those valves come together, it looks more like a pyramid than like a saddle of the mitral valve. Okay. So because of that, if you see a PISA, it suggests that you've got a pretty significant amount of blood that's trying to come through in the regurgitation hole, the, the you know, the orifice area. And so what that paper that I showed you before and up in the Dropbox by Rebecca Hahn and her group have said when they're looking at the tricuspid regurg is if you see a significant PISA, you know, if you've got a decent one there, that's probably significant of, a, of significant tricuspid regurg, so at least moderate tricuspid regurg. And I started using that more and more in my, you know, first analysis and, you know, making me want to go on and have a look at other things. Um, so... Yeah, the, the, if you see a PISA, that's suggestive of at least moderate tricuspid regurg. Cool. Um, I'll just speed up a little bit. What about this? So this is pulsed wave Doppler through the right ventricle outflow tract. I'd have to measure the pulmonary um valve acceleration time but it looks short mm. and there's a systolic notch which suggests significant pulmonary hypertension and the low wall filter has been switched on low wall filter that's sorry that was what i was trying to remember before sorry on a clinical week i'm slowly going crazy there we go if i did that so that's just using the timing from where it begins to the top All right, I'm on call. Can I just quickly just take this? Excuse me a sec. Guys, can I just have just one moment, please? Just hang on a sec. S excuse me, sorry. Um, very nice, Louise, beautiful. So that's less than 90 milliseconds, which suggests that there's significant um, pulmonary vascular resistance greater than two wooden units. Beautiful. Here's another look at the tricuspid regurgitation jet showing it heavily coloured in. And I do think there's, I think this is a better angle and we're still seeing that, um, we're still seeing that, that rapid deceleration, I think. It hasn't got that normal parabolic pattern. It's not a classic uh, early cutoff sign. Um, but it certainly does look like there is, uh, you know, it's lost that kind of parabolic pattern. And we've maybe got sort of early, uh, early peak gradients in there. Uh, I might just, here we can obviously see the significant RV dilation, the significantly elevated right atrial pressures. If we're worried about severe tricuspid regurgitation, what do we have to look for next? Uh, the effect on pulmonary venous flow. Right. What do you think of that? Your angle is going to underestimate the flow, but that's probably not important because it's going to underestimate it during systole and diastole. So looking at that, 
we have systolic flow reversal. Very nice. So all these things here during systole, beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave, we've got flow going in the wrong direction. It's going back towards the probe, okay? And that means that we've got systolic flow reversal. Blood should be going forwards the whole time. And it's not, it's going backwards during systole. It's a sign of significant tricuspid regurgitation and particularly points in my opinion during this to severe tricuspid regurg. So I would have no problem saying this is severe tricuspid regurg. If you do not have that trace, if you've forgotten, you can just look at the color box here. And if I just slow it down. So here we're just about to hit into systole and during systole it's red. Red is towards the probe, blue is away. It's like Bart Simpson, blue away, red towards. Red is towards the probe here. Red towards the probe during systole is a sign of severe tricuspid regurg and hepatic pain. Fantastic. So my last point with this is patients who have the chronically elevated, um, chronically elevated uh, RV afterload from things like pulmonary hypertension, we can get impaired LV filling. And what we can see well, here is this. Of improved LV filling. No, no, okay. no, but the left sided problems might have caused the problems with yeah, the pulmonary really, arteries. Yeah. So if we're looking at restricted filling, which. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Away. I'm just going to give you everything. Hang on a sec. Yeah, beautiful comment. So I was going to do that, 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 and. So looking at the mitral inflow, we can see that the E to A ratio is... I've forgotten to do it, but it'll be very, very high. It's high. It's above two, which yes. suggests... And the, the E wave is not hugely increased, but the E to A ratio greater than two means diastolic problems. And it means that the filling pressures in the left ventricle are going to be high. And looking at the E prime septum, 0 0.08. And looking at the E prime lateral, 0 0.08. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I so reckon this would... is overestimated, I'm going to add. So if we're putting this in the exam, you know, you'd I reckon expect you'd turn, 0 0.04. So you need to, yeah, you need to turn down the gain on this one. And when I'm measuring it, I'll be measuring it about there. 0 0.06. You know, okay. ignoring the fuzz. Average amount. So that would, less than that would mean uh, significant diastolic dysfunction, which is probably associated with the systolic dysfunction. And the pinch of salt we can add in there is the fact that he's also got a pacing wire in there, which makes it a little bit hard to use the traditional measures, to be fair. Um, but I thought oh, it was... Oh, no, but is he being paced at the moment? Well, I, hmm, I think he might be. He's got quite a large QRS complex that's going on there. But I think it was... That could be... Yeah, it was a good, good discussion point. Debate. Exactly, exactly right. So I think it's a really interesting comment there. We don't know if it's the left causing the right failure, but it, it could be. But it's definitely that the, there'll be a right component to that. And I think it's important that if we see this, if you've got old echoes, you've got to compare them. And so looking at this echo here from a few years before, we can see that there has been a significant change in the cardiac function. So if you do have the ability to look at old echoes, when you find significant findings, you must go back and look at it. And if you're writing a report, you must say that you've compared the two. Because of course, if there is a significant deterioration in the echo and the significant deterioration in the, in the clinical findings, there may be a cardiac component to it. And here we can see the right ventricle is much smaller in this echo from a few years before. The tricuspid regurg is still significant, but potentially not quite as but not quite as high. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I thought the right ventricle was nowhere near as markedly dilated, and there was less signs of the interventricle septum being pushed over to the left. So the right ventricle is much smaller. And the tricuspid regurgitation did not look as severe in some of the color wave at the same, uh, at the same scale, even if you turn up the gain. Big one for me was that we did not have that flying W sign 
on the RVOT VTI, suggesting that the pulmonary pressures were not as greatly elevated. The acceleration time was a little bit less, a little bit greater, as in it wasn't horrible signs. And we look like we've got much better looking markers of, uh, of movement and particularly the lateral wall, which is, uh, again, we can argue about diastolic function a little bit later, and the right ventricle function and size that markedly better on a previous echo compared to the one we had before. So I guess just the importance of trying to, uh, the importance of trying to have a look at everything together. If you've got old echoes, make sure you look at them and uh, take in the clinical context. So I guess that's the hour, guys. I hope that was useful. Were there any questions about any of that? No, all clear as mud. So many questions, but I'll, we'll ask them throughout the year, I think. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very, very much, guys. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.